My name is Sal Brinton. I am the president of the Liberal Democrats, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the first of our leadership hustings with our two absolutely outstanding candidates, Ed Davey on my right and Joe Swenson on my left. Um, this being a Liberal Democrat hustings, I just want to read out how we're going to run this. And uh, Ed and Joe will be able to recite this by the time they get to the end of the hustings process because all the hustings are happening in the same way. Thank you all for coming. Hand me that one. Uh, right, we'll, we'll have it over here anyway. No, no, let's have it over here anyway, just in case it goes again. Um, each candidate will be asked to give an opening statement lasting no more than six minutes. And the order in which they're speaking was determined by random lot at HQ yesterday. Uh, and at this stage, I'd like to introduce Terry Stacey, who is my aide. Desperately need his help because you've all submitted questions. And I think we're going to get through about five groups of questions tonight. And because there is no roving mic, for which I apologize, but we had hoped there would be, if you wish to ask the supplementary, please could you write it on the form that's on your seat and wave it, and then either Audrey or Adam, Audrey and Adam, please wave, will come and get it from you and hand it to Terry. They're both going to be very fit this evening. Um, we've only got an hour and a half, which means that I will be brutal in moving us on to the next question grouping. So if your question isn't asked, forgive me, but at the moment we'll probably be here till 1am and we still won't have asked all your questions. I think we'll spare the two candidates that. Um, please remember that, um, first of all, questions have to come from members, but I think that's evident from the ones you've submitted. Please remember that the questions have to be equally directed to both candidates. Uh, and if there's a question that is asked to one, I will make sure that I give the other candidate the opportunity to respond to it. After we've had around 70 minutes of questions, then we'll, I'll ask each of the candidates uh, in the reverse order to give us a very brief two-minute closing statement only. We have to conclude after 90 minutes, otherwise I'll be in trouble with the venue. And um, if anyone wants to tweet during this evening, please do so, and remember to use the hashtag LibDemLeadership Lib and hashtag LibDemSurge. Uh, and finally, just before we start, I want to thank London Liberal Democrats for helping with the arrangements for the venue and for laying on a bar. Please do use it later on. Uh, and a big congratulations are in order for topping the polls and beating Labour in Jeremy Corbyn's own backyard. <laughs> But huge thanks to everybody from across London and the home counties, because I know there are people here um, out, come from outside London, in our success in coming first in the European elections, returning three MEPs. So I'm now going to um, ask each of the candidates to give their opening statement, and we're going to hear from Ed first. Thank you, Ed. Friends. Oh, I think oh. I need a mic. There it is. <laughs> Friends, this is the first leadership contest in over a hundred years where we are at the top of the polls. <laughs> Winning in London, we are back in the game. The next leader's top priorities show that we can win even more. And I believe my political story shows I can do that for our party. First with my campaigning history. I won my seat here in London back in 1997 when I wasn't a target seat. I wasn't supposed to win, but we won. Because we built a great team from Kingston's local government campaigners and we had a simple message. Ed for education. <laughs> if our past success with Stop Brexit has taught us anything, it's taught us the value of simple messages like Stop Brexit. And I think such clear messaging can transform our party's fortunes. 
but we need to be honest with ourselves. Yes, we now have a clear, distinctive message for the current big political issue of the day, but what happens when we've stopped Brexit? For Brexit aside, our brand is not clear to most people. So if Liberal Democrats are to stay back in the game, tens of millions of people need to know instinctively what we stand for. Our late great friend Paddy Ashdown made sure people knew what we stood for. He said he'd sell his grandmother for a brand image for the party. But as his grandmother had already died, he just worked at it. And under Paddy, the Liberal Democrats became known as the strongest party on education and the party on the environment. And my political story can help us get known again as the party on the environment. For my political journey began before I joined the Liberal Democrats as an environment campaigner. After I read Seeing Green by Jonathan Porritt. Seeing Green alarmed me that humans could poison our own home. And the politician who spoke most clearly to me about the environment was Paddy. And I joined the party back in 1989. So just imagine how this environmentalist felt when I became Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in 2012. I raced for three years for renewables. And in office, I nearly quadrupled Britain's green energy and made Britain the world leader in offshore wind. I took on the fossil fuel establishment, the Treasury, and the Tories, and we won. And then in Europe. For three years, I led a climate change diplomacy initiative across our continent and negotiated successfully ambitious targets to cut greenhouse gases in 28 countries. And through Europe, I helped negotiate at the United Nations, leading ultimately to the Paris Climate Treaty. So I know climate politics at a time when solving the climate emergency is the most significant challenge facing our world. And I'm clear on the key climate fight ahead. It's to decarbonize capitalism to turn our economy green. To do this, we need to see fundamental change in the City of London, the banks, the stock exchange, the pension funds. We need to become the green capital of the world. Profoundly radical, but also practical too. We can have carbon-free capitalism. But I didn't join our great party just because of the environment. I'm a liberal through and through from human rights to civil liberties, from equality to internationalism. The liberal values we hold dear have never been more important, not least because they are under threat from growing national populism, the far right and the far left, from Islamophobia to anti-Semitism, from xenophobia to transphobia. These are actually worrying times, times for liberals to stand up and take on the peddlers of fear, my record shows I don't flinch from those fights. When I moved the amendment to abolish the Tories' appalling Section 28, when I fought for five years to get my constituent out of Guantanamo Bay, there were no votes in standing up for alleged Islamic terrorists. But I could not have been more proud when I secured Bisha's release. So for me, liberalism means standing up for justice, even when the baying hounds in the media are demanding blood. So my record on winning, on climate change, on liberalism, this is my pitch and my vision. But I can bring even more. I lost both my parents as a child, an experience that shaped my life. Many years later, Emily, my wife, and I have two wonderful children who shape our lives now, particularly my son, who has very special needs, as well as amazing abilities. So I've had quite a few personal challenges. But these have all taught me the importance of caring for others. How people must be helped when they are vulnerable. How vital our NHS is. So I want to lead a party that doesn't just tackle climate change and stop Brexit, 
but a party that cares for everyone and so heals the divisions in our country. A party and a capital city that reaches out to leave communities. A party that can give our, our country hope. Thank you. I'm running to be leader of the Liberal Democrats because I think our country is crying out for a liberal movement that can challenge the forces of nationalism and populism. And the Liberal Democrats should be at the heart of that movement, and I am the person to lead it. Now, we're having some good times in politics at the moment, aren't we, Lib Dems, right? You know. <laughs> 704 gains, 15 gains in MEPs. That poll today, you know, did anyone else wake up and think they were dreaming? <laughs> really good times. But we all know that it hasn't always been like that. And I just want to take you back to what, my, what was my worst day in politics. And it wasn't when I lost my seat in 2015, though, I mean, that's, that's up there in worst days in politics, Duncan and I both losing our seats on the same day with a 16-month-old son. But it was actually a year later, in 2016. And I'm sure for many of you it was the worst day too, when we woke up to the news that Leave had won the referendum. And for me, that was about so much more than leaving EU institutions. I felt affronted about what they said about who we are as a country, about our liberal values, felt that they were under attack. And I remember turning on that television and watching that Nigel Farage beaming out of the screen, surrounded by his heavies. And he said, and we won it without a shot being fired. And I felt sick because a week earlier, an MP had been murdered. And, you know, <laughs> He didn't seem to care what he had said. He had stood in front of that breaking point poster that would stoke division and fear and hatred in our country. And he did it deliberately. Now, that was what brought me back to politics. Because in 2017, Theresa May called that election, and I knew in a heartbeat that I was going to stand. I was going to win back Eastern Bartonshire. And, you know, I've never really been one to sit on the sidelines, you know, since I was a child. I used to go along to the body shop and buy my strawberry-shaped soap and sign my petition on whatever the issue was at the till. Fair trade, environmental policy, ending cosmetic testing on animals. I was inspired by Anita Roddick, who showed that business could be a force for good. Or then when I was a student and president of my halls of residence, campaigning to get internet connections in every bedroom. Or as a member of parliament, bringing forward legislation to tackle excessive packaging long before it was fashionable. And as a minister in the business department, cracking down on irresponsible payday lenders and naming and shaming rogue employers who failed to pay the national minimum wage. Now, this fight against nationalism that we face is one that in Scotland we have been fighting for more than five years. And we have fought and we have won. We won the referendum in 2014 to keep Scotland in our United Kingdom, in our great family of nations. And in 2017, I won my seat against the nationalists. And don't anyone be fooled by Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP they are nationalists. In 2014, one of my members in my constituency had a brick thrown through her window because she had a no thanks poster up. On polling day in 2015, my mum's car was vandalised because she had a Joe Swinson poster in the window. This is what we're dealing with. So how do we fight nationalism? Well, I think we have 
an unprecedented opportunity. Because people want the answer. They want those liberal values. And the fragmentation of our two-party system gives us this opportunity. To fight that nationalism, we need to bring together the forces of liberalism. We have 100,000 members and growing thousands of new members in the last week alone, some of whom might be here tonight, and if so, you are very welcome. Thank you for joining us. But there are 60 million people in our country, and millions of them have liberal values. We need to rally these forces of liberal-minded people and paint a positive alternative vision of hope, of being open-minded, open-hearted, and that there is a better future. One where the economy can be used to put people and the planet first, disrupting the old, outdated economic thinking, making sure that business is part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need to make sure we harness the technological revolution that is upon us so that it works for people so that we can use machine learning and uh, robotics and AI to deal with the climate emergency, to get those new energy solutions, to transform how we live, how we work, how we travel. And we can use this to fight disease, to tackle inequality, to deal with the big challenges that we are facing. And we need to change our politics. We need to build a liberal movement that is strong enough to make sure that we change our broken political system. So I am the leader for our liberal movement. We need a leader who will cut through in the media, reach new generations, and is the rallying point for the liberal cause. I'm that leader. Join me. Thank, thank you very much. Um, are, are the Sam, are the media leaving now, or are we continuing? We're just continuing. Okay. So I've got um, the first group of questions, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, is on Brexit. And um, the first two I will do together, and I'll ask Ed to respond first, then Joe. Um, there's a couple more here, but if you have a supplementary you want to ask, you remember you've got to use the form on your chair and wave it, and either Audrey or Adam will come and rescue it and bring it up to the stage. So Petra Fleming asks, what is the strategy to convince Brexiteers that revoking Article 50 is the best thing for the country? And where do you both stand on having no deal as an option in a second referendum? That's from Amanda Jayaratnam. Ed. Well, convincing Brexiteers isn't easy when they're Conservatives, but there is a distinction between them. There are some who we won't be able to reach. I think you know that brigade. Um, but there are others, I think, who are generally worried about a no-deal catastrophe. And I think we can reach some of them. But we've also got to talk to people in the Labour Party, too. And we've been worried about this for a little while now. And with the prospect of a no-deal lever being elected as Tory party leader and therefore prime minister, that worry has become a genuine and immediate fear. And so I've been thinking about how we can stop that. We've got some good news that Speaker Burkow says that no deal can't happen unless there's a vote in the House of Commons. I'm not yet clear on how and why he says that, so I'm writing to him to clarify. There is another way that we could put a humble address to Her Majesty. This is a parliamentary device that doesn't require a law. And if we had a cross-party humble address, we can, if it goes through on a vote on the House of Commons, that can make the Prime Minister, force the Prime Minister to revoke Article 50. But I'm clear that that technique should be used as a last resort. Because I do believe, ultimately, this question has to be settled in a people's vote. I know there are some in the party who think just revoke Article 50 and don't bother with a democratic exercise. I have to tell you, I strongly feel we have to. We may have to revoke Article 50 to stop a no deal, 
But we still then have to go back to the people. And the reason is simply this. We have a very divided country. And if we don't ask the people, if it doesn't finish with the people, I think it would be illeg illegitimate. And I think you could see serious unrest and those divisions getting very much worse. So I do think we have to have a people's vote. I think we can win it. The success we've seen in the last few uh, weeks now, actually, uh, suggests to me that we can win it. And I think that is the best way. Thank you very much. And Joe. So we, I think, we did an interview with Channel 4 News earlier, and uh, Cathy Newman was trying to get us to disagree uh, on Brexit, and uh, she tried in vain, it has to be said. Um, we, we do need to have a people's vote, obviously, if no deal is uh, uh, hurtling towards us, then revoking Article 50 to avoid that disaster is absolutely the path we should take. But we do need to have this decided by the people. And so how do we get that? Well, we need to get the votes in Parliament for a people's vote is the basic answer. Now, we've had 280 on the last count, so we're not a million miles from it. But we have a, a further way to go. And, you know, we've got everyone that's enthusiastic about a people's vote. They're already backing it. So the constituency that we have to win over are people who don't think a people's vote is a great idea, but will reluctantly come to the conclusion that it is the best way forward for our country. And that's why I think Philip Hammond's comments were very useful this week uh, on the radio. We know that there are government ministers that have been arguing behind closed doors for a people's vote. And we need to put pressure on them politically uh, and personally through our relationships that they need to act in the country's interest instead of just in the Conservative Party's interest. And I think that the no-deal scenario is the point at which that might be possible to get them to do. We did get a lot of Labour votes within that 280, but there may be some further votes from Labour, and I think that the European election results... You know, what our party achieved, what all of you achieved, has been hugely helpful in putting that pressure on Labour and on the Conservatives to make sure that they avoid no deal. And the way to avoid no deal is to agree to a people's vote. And an another thing that's come out of the European elections is that the idea of a general election uh, at this point, I think, has receded. We may still get one within the next year. But neither Labour nor the Conservatives are going to see that as the obvious thing to do at this point in time, much as Labour will argue for it. And then on the issue of the no deal uh, option on the ballot paper, we need to have a people's vote which has no unicorns on the ballot paper because we are in this mess because in 2016 we had Brexit means Brexit and frankly Brexit meant whatever people wanted it to mean. And if you're going to try and deliver something, it has to be specific. So I think the deal that is on the table at the moment, the negotiated withdrawal agreement, is the obvious thing to have on the ballot paper against Remain. My red line is that we have Remain on the ballot paper, the chance to stay in the European Union. It may well be that a future Prime Minister has some different negotiated arrangement. I don't frankly hold up much hope of them being able to get uh, much change from the EU, but perhaps they would have different detail on what the future relationship would look like, and by all means that might then be on the ballot paper. But our red lines need to be, it has to be specific, deliverable, and we have the chance to stay in the European Union. Um. Still sticking with the Brexit theme, the next question from Ken Kimber is, how are you going to clarify and amplify the virtues of EU membership whilst dealing effectively with past mistakes, for example, tuition fees? Jo, we're going to start with you on this one. I think that the problem of the 2016 referendum was that we just did the rational economic bit. We didn't do the heart bit. I, and it was a, a missive I actually sent to, uh, to, to the Stronger In campaign to make this case because 
I feared we were going to lose. My experience in the 2014 referendum in Scotland, and they're very similar issues because, do you know what, the arguments are pretty much identical, was that you had that strong economic case that it makes more sense for our economy to be in a single market and all of that, which we all know. But we also made the emotional case in Scotland. We pointed to the shared institutions that people love, the BBC, the NHS, the British Army. And we pointed to the fact that people had family and friends on different sides of the border and did they really want to be in a different country. And for many people, that was what made the difference. That their sister-in-law in Southampton or their husband who had come from, uh, from Middlesbrough, that, that this was their family right across the UK. And that emotional case, I do not think was made with nearly enough uh, vigor in 2016. Uh, I'll never forget Sheila Hancock, a couple of days before the referendum, talking on a, one of the debates. And she talked about losing her first husband in the war and how the, the feeling after the war about working with the Germans was really, really tough, but that the peace dividend that had been delivered was what made it worthwhile. And we need to have that emotional argument. That's how we clarify those virtues. On the issue of, in, in the past, things that we have done well, things that we've got wrong, I think we'd just be very straightforward. You know, we've done amazing things, not just in coalition government in Westminster, but we've done things in government in Scotland and in Wales. Caroline and the team in the uh, London Assembly and across councils, in local government. You know, we've got a strong record but obviously, we haven't got everything right, and we should be straightforward about that. And, and you know, own the, if we want to own the successes, we have to also own where we've got stuff wrong too. I'm an economist by training, but the case for EU membership has too often just been made by reference to the economy, just as Joe's just said. I think we absolutely have to make the emotional case for Europe when we get that people's vote. And I would start on peace. Because the European Union has rescued peace on our continent from two bloody wars. Actually, the European Union is preserving peace in our own country, in Northern Ireland. And I think people get that more than they got that in 2016. But I think we should make the case on peace because I think Europe may still have to be there to win the peace in the future. From terrorism, from Putin's Russia. And I'm particularly alarmed about the rising tensions between the US and China. Don't think that's necessarily going to end peacefully. When two superpowers cross, history shows it often ends in conflict. And Europe needs to be there, and Britain needs to be at the front seat, arguing for peace, striving for peace. When I was Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, I went to the European Union's table when Russia invaded the Crimea. And I proposed we had a European Union energy security strategy. So Europe bought less fossil fuels from Russia, and therefore gave, gave the Kremlin less for their military weapons. It's that sort of soft power that you can have at the European Union to bring peace. But I'd also make the argument, the emotional argument, on the basis of cooperation against criminals. There are some wicked people in our world, international organized crime gangs. Before Liberal Democrat MEPs like Graham Watson got things like the European arrest warrant, there was a place called Costa del Crime in Spain, with lots of British bank robbers and murderers. And thanks to the European arrest warrant, they're now serving time. And I think that actually is an emotional argument to many. I think if we told people in leave areas that actually Europe makes you safer, safer from murderers and terrorists and people who, who smuggle human beings, this is a good argument. And I think we need to see more of that if we get that people's vote. I failed to answer part of the last question, which is very naughty of me, uh, because you wanted to know whether no deal should be on the ballot paper, in my view. And in my view, it shouldn't be. 
Um, I think the problem with no deal at the moment is it doesn't mean anything. You know when she said Brexit means Brexit? And that was completely hopeless? Well, it's now no deal means no deal. It is complete fantasy. And we need to challenge these no dealers. What does it mean? Because the day after you no deal, you'll have to negotiate. And they don't tell people that. And we need to call these people out. There's no such thing as no deal. Because you'd have to go back and make a no deal. And we can't let these right-wing extremists get away with lying to the British people again. Yay. Yay. Tuition fee is the easy question. <laughs> Look, listen, I think we've got to remind people that when we put it in, there were maintenance grants to help the people from the lowest incomes. And the Tories got rid of them. We need to remind people that we wanted ner uh, student nurse bursaries, which made sure we had nurses going, to, nurses going to university and going into our health service. The Tories got rid of them, and we have a nursing crisis. We should argue positively what we did. And some of the money we saved, we put into the youngest children, through our pupil premium, through our free school meals. And we really helped the people who needed it. So I agree with Joe. We should be proud of what we achieved. And don't let anyone else tell you otherwise. We made mistakes on some of the politics. We made mistakes on some of the policies. Because in a coalition, you have to compromise. It's part of being a coalition. And if we believe in pluralist politics and coalition, we should understand that and explain that to people. But I'm not going to apologise for nearly quadrupling green energy. I'm not going to apologise for taking millions out of low-paid of, uh, low people out of tax. I'm not going to apologise for making sure people had decent pensions in their retirement. They, we should be proud of what we achieved. Thank, thank you, Ed. We're going to move on to the second group of questions now. You'll see how rapidly time is moving past. Um, this one, it, it, the topic area is summarised by the first question, but I'm going to give two to both Ed and then Joe because they cover broadly the same thing. Apart from bollocks to Brexit, what's your big idea? And beyond, from David Martin, slightly more elegantly, beyond Brexit, which issue is your top priority and how would you solve that issue, Ed? Take carbon out of capitalism. We have to be radical about our economy, and that means trying to make sure that our economy is working for our planet. And at the moment, it's not. Britain may, be, may represent only 1% of global greenhouse gases, but in the city of London, we fund 15% of fossil fuel investment. So actually, we're responsible in our country, in this capital, for a huge amount of the climate crisis. And we need to say, and we need to be tough on this, we need to say to our debt markets, our pension funds, our stock exchanges, our banks, you have to take climate risk seriously. And if we do that, we can switch trillions of dollars of pounds and euros from dirty, polluting, climate-destroying fossil fuel investment and switch it into green technologies. There are huge opportunities to turn our planet green and safe and we can get people to invest in them. And if you think I'm just, it's pie in the sky and it's radical nonsense. I've been to see Mark Carney. Mark Carney is the governor of the Bank of England. He wants to do this. He's waiting for politicians to show real leadership. I think we should be the party to do that. We should take carbon out of capitalism and stop climate change. So I think we need a fundamental rethinking of the way our economy works. To make it work for the planet, yes, but for people too. For far too many people, things have not been working. That deal that if you work hard and play by the rules, then you'll get on in life. That, that's broken for so many people. And we need to reshape that economic model. Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand this week has announced that their new goal 
is going to be well-being, not being a slave to GDP figures. This is an issue I have been writing about and arguing for since 2006. I co-founded the All-Party Group on Wellbeing Economics in 2009. And I think the time is ripe for a different way of focusing our economy. And instead of this model where big business just goes and makes profit and focuses only on their shareholders and then they'll pay taxes which need to be redistributed and then it's up to government to do the fairness bit. I say we need to start the other way around. We need to set out as a country what our goals are, the big challenges, the climate emergency, tackling inequality, improving health and well-being. And then we need to rally all of the different parts of our country. Yes, our public services and government. Yes, our local communities and grassroots volunteering. And also our business community to unlock the power of innovation and entrepreneurship to tackle those challenges. That's the type of economy we need to be creating so that it works for the planet and for people. Um, thank you. The, the first supplementary from this group, which is um, policy themes other than Brexit, is from Linda Morgan, who says, as a refugee, she hopes permanently from the Labour Party, she wants to know especially about Lib Dem policy to deal with the current appalling levels of poverty and inequality in this country. Ed. Well, we should be, first of all, radical on public services. Uh, people who are on lower incomes depend on our NHS. They depend on our schools. They depend on public transport. They depend on the police. These public services are absolutely essential if you're going to tackle... Uh, inequality. And I'm currently Home Affairs spokesperson and what I really feel passionately about the need to invest in more police for is because it's the less well off, it's the more vulnerable who are most likely to be victims of crime. And the cuts in community police have had most effect on those people. So if you want social justice, you first of all need to invest in our public services. But you've got to do things in addition. And here in the capital, it's housing costs which are the biggest problem. I have vice surgeries for my constituents twice a week. I've been doing them for 20 years. And housing for all those 20 years has been the biggest issue I've had to deal with. And I am so tired that we pay huge amounts of housing benefit to private landlords who provide some appalling accommodation. And I believe we can switch that money. If you go back 40 plus years, the state used to invest in the bricks and mortar, used to build council homes. And what's happened over 40 years, that subsidy has gone into housing benefit to pay private landlords, some of whom are good, but some of whom are not. I don't think we're getting the best value for that money. And I would like us to see quite a radical approach where we switch the housing subsidy back into the home and to build a huge number of council homes. I think that would have probably the biggest effect of any policy on tackling poverty, not just here in the capital, but in many cities and towns across our country. We're a rich country. We should have a situation where everyone is able to live in a decent home and to have enough money to live with dignity. And throughout their life, from the moment they're born, through their education, through their working life, and then into retirement, that they can be looked after. And particularly when things go wrong, that they can get the support that they need. And that's not the society we have at the moment. Now, the government currently will argue that work is the best route out of poverty. And as a former employment relations minister, I'm a big fan of getting people into work. But work has to be meaningful. The jobs have to be good jobs where people are valued and treated with respect. And at the moment, we have a fundamental problem in that 
people are being expected to work and try to live on the minimum wage and, and it's just, for many people, not possible. I, I often find this sort of disconnect in London. Uh, when, I was, when I was out of politics and, and running my own business, I went to this business dinner and I had this conversation with a guy and he sat next to me and he was moaning at me because of George Osborne's uh, then change to the uh, pension rules so that you would, I think, only be able to save £1.25 million into a pension tax-free. And he, he said to me that this was a problem because it was going to cost him £36,000 a year. Uh, and I turned around and I said, you know, it's going to cost you £36,000 a year, which is significantly more than the average wage. And that this cut is being made, one of the few things I actually agreed with what the government was doing at the time, uh, in a context where they were cutting tax credits hurting the poorest families. And I, th I felt there was a disconnect, actually, between our capital and the rest of the country, but also between the two Londons. You know, those, those marble-floored HQ buildings of law firms and accountancy firms, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, with their sort of reception area and all the plants and the funky chairs and, and everybody earning huge amounts of money. And they don't feel like they're earning huge amounts of money because it costs a lot to live in London. It's absolutely right on that. But then I think about the people that go and clean those buildings... I, I, it just hurts me to think, how on earth do they live? Or how many hours are they travelling for to come and work on a minimum wage job? And there is something fundamentally wrong that we are basically subsidising employers, paying people at wages that they cannot afford to live on. That is unsustainable and it is not the way our economy should work. And we need to move towards a scenario where if you're earning that minimum wage, that should be a wage that you can live on. And so I do agree that home building is a crucial part of this, but we need to look at that fundamental relationship between what people earn, whether they can live on it, and whether therefore that is ethical for us to just be saying we'll just subsidise those wages and that will be a subsidy to big businesses with those marble headquarters who aren't paying their cleaners nearly enough money. Right. Um, the last... The last question in this round, it really is a quick fire answer please um, and I'm going to go stick with Ed and Joe and then on the next round of questions I'll turn it around what would you do about the ongoing organised corporate tax evasion by Starbucks Amazon and others well first of all I stay in the European Union <laughs> I think I'll say that every time because it's going to get claps every time but, but, but seriously, you're only going to tackle this sort of corporate tax evasion if you work internationally, and particularly at Europe. But also in the OECD, uh, when I was a business minister for the first two years, um, I did some work with the OECD trying to make sure we can stop some of this tax arbitrage where people uh, are taking their uh, taxes to low, the lowest, uh, profit, uh, lowest corporate tax jurisdiction and you can only do that if you've got international cooperation. So the EU is part of it, but we have to go beyond the EU. Another thing that we can actually do, and I will end it, you told me to be quick, I'm not being quick, um, is that we need to, through our development help to the poorest countries, we need to help them with their tax officials. Because many of them don't have the tax officials to tax the corporates properly. And if we could help them, they'd raise more money for their people and we wouldn't see this, these corporations evading tax. So it's about governments and democracies working together and it's also about rich countries realising helping the poorer countries is in our own interest, both morally but also economically. So I'll say three quick issues on this. The first is absolutely international cooperation to secure good standards so that you can't just take a pick and mix approach to where you pay your tax is absolutely essential and particularly for the Starbucks type companies of this world. 
The second thing is the tech companies, which were in the question, like Amazon and uh, Google and Facebook. And that's actually a different issue. Because part of the problem is, if their activity in the country is apparently their marketing department and so on, that just doesn't come close to capturing the value they actually create in the com country. And it's one of the things I've pressed the government on this and the, the Treasury. And to be fair, the Treasury has actually said that they will start to move on this. Europe is discussing uh, whether or not you can have a, a sort of tech tax which is based more on the number of users in a particular country. And, you know, getting the exact, you know, how that, how that will work best will probably take some time. It will take some international cooperation. But we should be prepared as a country to say, if that can't be done, we will start and do this on our own. And I think that that is an important marker to put down, which I would agree rarely with something the government has done. The final thing comes back to my point about business responsibility. Because it's just not okay to evade tax. And it should be something that makes you feel like a pariah in the business community. In the same way that I introduced naming and shaming for companies that don't pay the national minimum wage, in the same way that I fought and secured gender pay gap reporting, and both of those changes have forced companies to look seriously at what they're doing and whether it stacks up. I think transparency can be a hugely important tool to force and shame companies into better behaviour because they have to justify their position and we need to use that power of transparency. Thank you. Um, we're, we're moving on to the next group of questions now which um, broadly we could describe as working with other parties and we've got quite a lot of questions which are perhaps best summarised by these three or four. Um, what is your approach to forming an alliance with other Remain parties such as Green, SNP and Change? What is your message for Labour and the Green Party voters to ask them for their support either in lending us their vote or working with them in coalition? Um, Judy Dixie asks, um, joining with the Greens or beating them at their own game, i.e. outgreening the Greens, what's your view which is best? And Bridget Gardner says, Given Adam Price of Plaid's uh, urging for Remain parties to work together, what do you think we should do? Jo, we're coming to you first on this line. So one thing that the last few weeks have shown us is that the Liberal Democrats are absolutely clearly the rallying point for Remain voters in this country. And we need to be confident about that. We need to be at the heart of this movement to stop Brexit and the wider movement for our liberal values. We do need to work with others. And this is what we do as Liberal Democrats. We know that with 11 MPs, we're not going to stop Brexit unless we work cross-party. And we have been doing that successfully, and I will continue to do that. My general view is that if you share our Liberal values, you should join the Liberal Democrats and be part of our party. And there will be people who do not share our values, like the SNP, but where we agree on some things, like stopping Brexit. So we'll work together on stopping Brexit. Or, dare I say it, Andrea Leadsom, who I disagree with on almost everything. But I worked with on modernising Parliament and bringing in proxy voting for MPs and improving the harassment and bullying policy. So we need to be grown up about this and work with people where we agree, but be confident in our position as the Liberal Democrats. We do have local circumstances that will make sense in different areas. And I know there's parts of London and places like Oxfordshire and Brighton where local parties have come to arrangements with the Greens. And it makes sense for local people to be able to make those decisions about how that works best. And I, I would encourage that to happen where it works. You know, in Scotland, you know, the Greens are pro-independence. It's a very different kettle of fish. So again, it, it's working where it makes sense. Uh, but we absolutely need to make clear to people that we are the party which has the plans to tackle the climate emergency. And that is a core, core part of our message. So liberal values, join us where we agree, let's work together.
in Parliament, we have to work with other parties. Simple. Uh, I'm happy to work with Tories, Labour, whoever, to stop Brexit. And we need to corral those votes. And we've been doing that month in, month out. I think when it comes to elections, I think different tests apply. You know, we live in a first-past-the-post system. We want to change it, but we have to deal with what we've got. And there is absolutely no doubt that the evidence shows we are the lead Remain party, and many of the parties that people talk about, frankly, have no strength. I was extremely cautious about Change UK when they came on the scene. And I was extremely cautious because I knew some of them. <laughs> very nice people, very nice people. One lady, Joan Ryan, I've worked with for 15 years on Tamil rights and human rights in Sri Lanka. But she chaired the No to AV campaign for the Labour Party. I wasn't convinced that we had much in common. What I also noticed about Change UK is they didn't have much in common with each other. <laughs> so I'm not convinced that they really are a sustainable party, and I am so proud of us that we actually kept them at bay and we absolutely beat them. <laughs> and I think we should outgreen the Greens. Uh, under Paddy, we were the Green Party. We were known for our environmental policies. We can and should be again. And I have to say, the Green Party's policies are not any good for the environment. Have you read any of them? They're just confused. And uh, therefore, I think we need to be proud of our sensible policies, which will make a dramatic difference. And we should make sure that people see us as that party. Now, when it comes to local parties, Joe was right to raise that. Um, I would advise against pacts and deals with the Greens, even at local level. But I tell you as leader, I wouldn't dare Tell a local party what to do. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We're going to move on now to a transport and climate change question. Um, both of you are committed to tackling climate change and one massive help is improving public transport use in this vein. What are your rail and transport policies and plans? That's from Christopher Moss. I think we're starting with you, Ed, this time. Well, I won't be asking Chris Grayling. Uh, that would be my start. <laughs> uh, apparently, he's thinking of, uh, of applying to be the Tory uh, party leader. <laughs> but uh, he, his ferry was delayed. <laughs> his train was cancelled. And he was last seen on a replacement bus service in Maidstone. Uh, but seriously, I, and I think um, the problems in our rail services are, are ginormous. In my constituency, the franchise changed uh, a little while ago, and the franchise operator, Southwestern Railway, frankly couldn't organise a in a brewery. Well, we're allowed to say it in our party now, aren't we? Um, so, you know, I, I think we have to look at the franchising system. I think it's completely broken. Um, I'm always been unconvinced about the separation between track and train. I think we need to look at that again. And um, when it comes to a lot of public services and past utilities, I think we can look at different models. You know, it's not just private, public. There are models that are not-for-profit, mutual organisations. And I think we need to think quite radically about how we transform our rail industry. But we need to be careful because, as we've seen, a little bit of change can completely disrupt our whole, uh, our whole rail system, uh, which is in, has been in meltdown. So let's have some radical policies that think them through very carefully. But above all, I do think we need to make sure we're investing in the trains of the future. Not least because we have got to stop internal flights in the United Kingdom. It's 
climate change secretary, I had a, a scientist, a chief scientist in my department. Uh, he's fortunately he's died now, but Professor David Mackay, when I asked him what was the thing that you could do most in your life to make a contribution to stopping climate change, he said, easy, stop flying. So we've, I know sometimes you have to fly. Of course, sometimes you have to fly. But we need to find ways through our public transport systems, particularly through railways, to absolutely minimise the flights that happen. I'm, I'm glad Ed, Ed qualified on sometimes you have to fly, otherwise I think uh, it would have been an interesting conversation with the Chief Whip, Alistair Carmichael, who uh, represents Orkney and Shetland. Uh, uh, I think the, the, the problems in our rail service, and in my constituency it's the number one issue, ScotRail is appalling in terms of service, you know, Mogai... Uh, train line is the, the worst in terms of punctuality in Scotland and possibly in the whole of Britain. One of the reasons is that more people are travelling by train. So, I mean, there's something positive from this. You know, train, train usage has gone up hugely and there is a great appetite from people who want to take the train. But the trains need to be reliable, they need to be on time, they need to be clean, uh, they need to be a, an experience where people will, uh, will appreciate it as part of their commute to work and how they get about. And, and a big part of this is actually therefore about the investment. We're trying to run a 21st century transport network on largely Victorian infrastructure. And we have to invest. We are so far behind other countries on this. And at a time when borrowing costs are low, it is the ideal time to invest. And even high speed two, which is a fraction of what needs to happen. You know, the high speed two, which is still seen as so controversial, you know, is only planned to go to Manchester at the moment. We need to have that infrastructure fit for the 21st century if we're going to decarbonise the way in which we get about this country. It is absolutely essential. And I, and I see it every day. You know, I have, you know, I commute between Glasgow and London. I have many constituents who do the same. And if we want people to be able to do journeys like that by rail, then we need to make sure the rail network is reliable, it is fast, it is clean, and it is an experience people want to have. And I think the biggest thing we need to do is make sure we invest now so that we have that rail network for the future. Thank, thank you, Joe. We're going to move to some quicker fire questions. So um, here is one on diversity from Isabel Parasaram. What are your top three priorities on diversity and how will you deliver on those? And we're starting with Joe. It's been, uh, I think, 18 years since I've been hugely involved in this party's bid to improve diversity. And I started off in 2001 making a speech against the idea of all women shortlists. I had really high hopes that our party was going to deliver equality without that, and I believed it could happen. And I have to say, I was pretty disappointed in the experience I had effectively banging my head against a brick wall with many others in this party to try to get these issues taken seriously enough by successive leaders, and I'm talking about leadership in the widest sense at all levels of our party. I think we need to be really, really honest with ourselves. Let's look around the room. Just now, look around you. Is this London? I don't think we're representative enough of London. Um, the most, one of the most multicultural cities in the world. And we, we, we really need to be able to reach out better. So, the, so it starts, I would say, by being honest with ourselves, not pretending that, that this is all okay. I'm delighted that our MEP group is the most diverse parliamentary grouping that we have. But it's so far from job done. So we need to be honest with ourselves. We all, every single person in this room has a responsibility. Our candidates list is overwhelmingly white and male. So everybody here can take responsibility and talent spot and ask people who would be good candidates if they've thought about standing and support them in doing so. And I also think that 
at leadership level, and as leader this is what I would seek to do, making sure that the rooms in which decisions are being made are as representative as possible. Because I'm frankly a bit sick of going to rooms that are entirely white and we're having discussions about the future of our country, or being the only woman in the room, or one of two or three women out of ten, we need to just do it and be diverse and make it a priority. And as a leader, I think that's something you have a real opportunity to do and I am determined to do. This is a critical challenge. Um, when I was a minister, I worked with others to set up an organisation called Powerful Women. I'm now on the board of Powerful Women, and what Powerful Women does is try to make sure women in the energy sector get to the top. And we need to see more of those initiatives. In my own borough, where we, uh, I'm proud to say I've encouraged and given confidence and said you should stand to, to many women, people from BAME communities, I'm proud that Kingston Council has more women councillors than men. And we have six BAME councillors, including Britain's first Korean councillor. So one needs to see that across the party. Um, I will not rest until we have at least 50-50 men and women MPs in the House of Commons. And we need to do far more for black and ethnic minority Liberal Democrats. If you look at our target parliamentary seats, frankly, uh, we've got Leila Moran, a wonderful MP, uh, half Palestinian, but our only other candidate, as far as I'm aware, and I'm sorry if I'm wrong about this, but as far as I'm aware, is Cameron Hussein in Leeds Northwest. I want to make sure Cameron gets elected next time. But our party needs to do more on national policies, not just our own. And it is a complete disgrace the government are not bringing forward the Gender Recognition Act so we can tackle transphobia and we give people the rights that they deserve. Ed has just moved into the area of the next question, so um, I'll give Ed the chance to, to come back, but if Joe could start on this one. Given recent attacks, both at home and abroad, on LGBT plus rights, particularly the vile anti-trans campaigns last year around the GRA reform, what will candidates do to ensure we remain at the forefront of the fight, not only for tolerance, but also for acceptance? Well, first of all, can I wholeheartedly endorse that sentiment and the question that this is not about tolerance. This is about embracing our diversity and recognising that our strength as a country comes from the fact that individuals are unique and we need the strengths of everybody if our country is going to succeed. And you know, the cost to our country of forcing people to suppress part of their identity when they go to work or school or college and feel that they cannot properly be themselves, we all lose out hugely from that wasted potential. So we need the legislative procedures in place, but this is a cultural issue. You know, we've currently got Esther McVeigh saying that it should be uh, possible that young people don't have to learn about the fact that gay people exist at school. And we need to say, no, that is wrong. We are a liberal society and people have all sorts of different family structures and it is okay. And, and this is not some issue about, you know, telling children about sex at too young an age. This is about saying, you know, some people have got two, two mums, two dads, you know, get over it. It's not, it's not an issue, right? So we need to have that education in schools. And I'm proud that Liberal Democrats, you know, I, I fought, um, including at the cabinet table when I got allowed to go on occasion for sex education to be compulsory in all schools and we are fighting for it to be LGBT inclusive because every child needs to have that safe environment at school. So we, the, the other issue we need to tackle is this transphobia and there is, I think in our, in our public debate, I, I fear the way that feminism gets pitted against trans rights in a totally false choice. And, I, I, and it's exhausting. It's as if, it's as if there's some, some difficulty here. You know, trans women 
are women and therefore feminism should be embracing uh, trans issues. People who are experiencing multiple discrimination, I mean, that is the way in which discrimination is experienced. You know, you're not just a black woman or a white man. You know, you might be a white man who happens to be gay. You might be a black woman who happens to be old. And you're facing all of these different ways in which society has a, a way of trying to suppress people and push them down. We need to understand the nature of our own privilege and also the experiences of others. So the most important thing I think we need to do is more listening. Yesterday, uh, I launched my campaign in London, and then I got on the train to Stockport. And I met a number of young people at Stockport Youth Council. And one young woman there told me and the other people in the room how she had been beaten up at school and beaten up on the way home because of her sexuality. I held my head in my hands. I cannot believe that is still happening in our country. I thought when we got rid of Section 28, we were enabling schools to actually educate children and tell them that every individual is important. No matter of their sexuality, no matter of their race, no matter their gender. We've clearly got a long way to go. And we've got to do it in our schools. And we've got to make sure, as Joe said, that proper sex and relationship education teachers about everybody uh, and I think then we need to go further. I was dismayed when we had a debate about police resources which said police resources shouldn't be going to tackle hate crime. That's just wrong. Hate crimes are hate crimes and we will only sort this out if people realize that that is the case. There is going to be a pu you will be punished if you hurt someone because of their sexuality or their race. So I think we've got education, schools, we need to improve pastoral care, we need to give the schools support so they really, really get behind quality sex relationship education. And we need to make sure to the police that these are crimes that they must take seriously and they must investigate. Thank you. The next question is from Clive Robinson. Um, he joined the Young Liberals in 1972 and has relentlessly campaigned for PR. Given we can assume a measure of influence after the next general election, what strategy would you adopt to guarantee that the next general election will be the last under first past the post? Well, to guarantee something is a bit of a tough test, I have to tell you. Um, I actually think we've got the strategy wrong for about 30 years in our party. Because I think if you're going to win the argument, you have to get people used to PR regularly. And how do you do that? You bring STV PR into local government. Liberal Democrats did that in Scotland. Joe will be able to tell me more about that. She's experienced. She's used the system, you lucky person. Um, but my view is, if people get used to preferential voting, and it's really complicated, you have to count to one, two, three, four, five. If people can get used to that, those nonsense arguments we heard in the AV referendum will disappear. And so I want to make sure that we set the foundations for getting rid of our appalling, undemocratic, unrepresentative first-past-the-post system. And I think, as all things with Liberal Democrats, we start at local government. We get that right, and we will win the argument, guaranteed. This issue is strategically vital not just for our party, but for our politics. So much of the mess of where we're at now is because of our voting system. 
It sounds like a really geeky point when you say that to people, but I think people are starting to understand. And it's right to say that in Scotland, we introduced STV for local government elections. Scotland's actually a bit of a Liberal Democrat electoral reform geek's dream. We've got four different voting systems. We've just had De Haunt for the European elections. We've got STV and local government. We've got the additional member system for the Scottish Parliament and obviously still first past the post for Westminster. Uh, and of course, the reform of 16-year-olds being able to vote as well in all but Westminster elections, which is another incredibly important electoral reform. We have been campaigning on this forever. It's one of the two reasons why I joined this party, the other being uh, education. I think, though, that the fragmentation of our politics provides us with a unique opportunity, and we actually need to work with other parties. This is not about after the election. This is about before the election. I think this is about trying to make sure that lots of different parties each have a commitment. Possibly, if we can achieve it, even the exact same worded commitment in our manifestos so that we build up the support in Parliament and it can become possible that there could be a majority of MPs in a future Parliament, particularly if this system fragments as it looks like it could do. And, and in that scenario, it is so important that we deliver electoral reform. We have tried it the other way. We have tried spending decades getting up to 50 or 60 MPs and waiting until there's a hung parliament and going into coalition and we got squashed. That is not the way to deliver this. I think we need that cross-party approach to make this happen. Uh, the next questions are from James Dart and Bart Bloomfield. How would you bring young people back to the party in the same pre-coalition numbers? And how are you going to convince new and first-time Lib Dem voters to continue supporting the party? And Joe, we're starting with you. Well, I think that we have such an opportunity right now with our Stop Brexit campaign. Uh, this morning, I was visiting a, a tech startup which basically trains apprenticeships in digital skills so the apprentices I was meeting were all in their uh, late teens early 20s you know I, I really struggle to remember the last time I spoke to a young person that was in favor of Brexit and this is the issue where we can absolutely connect with young people Jeremy Corbyn has let down that generation that got so enthused back in 2017. But those young voters have seen that he has entirely let them down. And we need to stick to our guns. We need to go out there and we need to say, we are the party to stop Brexit. We are the ones that have got your back. And the other thing we need to do, we need to get really serious about digital. You know, who, who reads newspapers anymore? Yeah, not people under 30, right? They might read them on their smartphones, right? But, but we need to be at the forefront of digital. And you know, when I joined this party in 1997, we were the most wired political party. I remember the KICS conferencing system, which if you think back to it, um, I mean, it was, it was kind of a bit old school, but at the time, that was cutting edge. And now, we're not at the forefront. I mean, what Labour does with momentum in terms of the videos they produce, I, I mean, I disagree with the content, but you cannot fault their simplicity of messaging and the way in which they engage. So at, at the moment, we clearly need more resource than digital and we want to get more resource for the party. But even with the existing resource that we have, we do not have the right split between digital and everything else when the total number of people we really have in our HQ working on digital is two. The first thing I do is listen to young people and ask young people in the party their ideas. I do think we have to open up the policy process in our party. Uh, it's just not open enough to new members, to people who uh, can't get to conferences, and particularly to young people. And I think if we can get more ideas in to whoever is the leader, 
then I think that will strengthen our party no end. But I'm not trying to dodge the question. It might look like I am, but I'm not. Um, I do agree with Joe about Brexit. But I think, actually, climate change may well be more powerful to more people. Um, we saw, led by that amazing Swedish uh, young woman, Greta Thunberg, that the world's young people are revolting. Don't get me wrong by the revolting <laughs> word. Uh, you know, I, I, they're fantastic. Uh, and uh, the Stockport Youth Council yesterday, we were talking about climate strikes. And I'm just so proud of the young people. Uh, and I'm, we were right to get behind them. When some of the crusty Tory ministers were saying, <laughs> you know, we were saying, this is an education opportunity. Good, good phrase, good phrase. Um, and I think uh, it allowed that, that passion that young people have to make a better world to come out, and we need to listen to them. And I think there are probably many other issues which I probably don't understand. I'll be honest with you. I'm one of the people who still has a kick's email address, going back to Paddy when he had the, the, the kick's online stuff. Um, probably new members will explain that afterwards in the part of our... Um, <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I think issues that we were talking about earlier, about sexuality, young people are miles ahead of us on these issues. Uh, and we need to listen to them and make sure we're in tune with them. Uh, and I think any leader needs to find that way because, I mean, Joe's a bit younger than me, I'll, I confess, and probably is a bit more with it. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think she'll admit that, you know, uh, there are a little few years between us and real young people. Um, and I think the best way is to listen. So this is the final question, and it's actually um, two put together into one. From the perspective of a fellow MP, what key qualities of our previous leaders have made them good colleagues for you? And the second one is, and what quality in your opponent do you most admire? Joe. So, well, we, we've, had, we've had so many amazing leaders and I have to say one of the great sadnesses of the last uh, set of election results which have been so good has been that um, both Charles and Paddy weren't there to see this because they would have loved it. Paddy was the leader when I joined, and I remember when I went to uh, the conference as a member of Lib Dem Youth and Students, he did like a meet the leader session, and his informality, he kind of turned the chair around and sat astride it, took his jacket off, and you know, that, that informality that he had, uh, and that, uh, that sense of uh, drive was uh, something to behold. Charles uh, just connected with people and um, Charles came and campaigned with me in 2015 just a few days before the election and you know he just he he sort of lit up the place everybody wanted to come and talk to Charles and and that was the last time I saw him you know uh, and, and and that was you know a huge um, you know, huge huge sadness but he was he was really amazing and you know, and, and Ming just has such wisdom in my foreign affairs brief. Being able to pick Ming's brains on foreign affairs has been amazing. Uh, and of course, Nick. Well, you know, Nick achieved for the Lib Dems. You know, taking our party into government when he started to say it. It was it was something which people thought would never happen. And he had that vision, and he went and he did it, and took us there, led us there. And Vince, who was my Secretary of State when I was a Minister in Biz, just his wisdom that he has been able to impart has been superb. So I think we've had, you know, in my time, lots of different leaders who have brought lots of different qualities. Um, I hope I will be your next leader. Um, and, and if I am, then I think I know who I'll be asking to be my climate change spokesperson because I think Ed's record on this is just superb and we should be so proud to have somebody with that, uh, that experience and that passion on climate change within our party. Thank you, Joe. Um, you've talked about most of the leaders and not left me a huge amount, so you've done a really good job. 
Um, I, I want to talk about Paddy, uh, because I worked with him as a member of parliament, but also as the party's economics advisor between 1989 and 93. And I'd get in on Monday mornings, and the phone would ring, and he'd go, Evan, <laughs> come to our room. And he would had a mad idea over the weekend. He'd read the Sunday newspapers, and he was determined that this was going to save the country and get us coverage, and I often had to tell him no. Um, but he still wrote me these amazing notes every so often, not, not all the time, um, because he valued all the staff. And he'd write these little I've still got them in his wonderful handwriting, saying thank you. And there are not many leaders, not just political parties, but in companies and across the society, who take the time to do that. I think that was a true mark of the man. It used to be slightly unnerving, though, because in those days, it was quite de, de rigueur in the Lib Dems to go to the gym in the House of Commons. It was much cheaper then. And there's a sauna there. And when you went into the sauna and there was the leader of your party and your boss, it really sort of endeared you to him in ways that we can't talk about. <laughs> he, he, he was a, a, an amazing, amazing guy um, and uh, a true, true leader. Um, people would say they'd follow him just out of curiosity. <laughs> um, so I'm not going through all the leaders, um, but I do want to mention Tim. Because Tim spoke with such passion and emotion. And I think that's what our party needs to do. Because sometimes we're so bloody reasonable. There was a survey of members which said we love to be evidence-based. It was one of your top things. Oh, I like evidence-based policies. Oh, I do. Well, so do I. Yes, of course. I like reason and rational thought. But you're not going to win votes by giving out the figures and the facts. You've got to give her the emotion. And boy, did Tim do that. He was sublime on that. And I think I le would learn a lot from him. Um, Joe is just uh, an amazing campaigner, particularly on diversity. Um, she's been a real leader in Scottish politics, in, in British politics. Um, and you know what she did... Uh, on things like shared parental leave, I think we should all thank her for. Thank, thank you both very much. We're now moving to the two-minute concluding statements, and as Jo was second before, she's going to start. Well... I share an office with Tim Farron, so I think I've now got to buy a particularly nice packet of biscuits uh, for when he comes in next week. Um, I think tonight has been such a positive evening, and we should all feel really optimistic about the future of our party and where we can take the country. And I know that Ed and I are going to go to so many more of these events over the coming weeks. And the attendance here, the fact there are so many new members in our party with thousands having joined in recent weeks should fill us all with a great deal of hope. Now, one of the things that I often hear in terms of complaints, and I think probably everybody in this room has probably put a comment on Facebook at one point or another to say, why do we not get more cut through on the media? Well... I would say to you that this week alone, I've been out there talking for the party, celebrating our successes and setting out our vision on LBC, on talk radio, on the BBC, on ITV, on Channel 4, on Sky, on Radio 2, on Newsnight, on Question Time and on the Today programme twice. So if you want a leader who will cut through with the media who can reach new generations and be the rallying point for the liberal movement that our country so desperately needs, because we need to take this opportunity, then I am the leader that you need to vote for to lead our great party. Join me.
You have a really serious choice. The Tories think they're choosing the next Prime Minister. Well, there's no cap on our ambition. There shouldn't be. And there shouldn't be because our country needs us to win. To defeat those dark forces that we know around, the national populism that Joe talked about, that is the divide in British politics. It's no longer left or right. It's that authoritarian, nasty politics, the right, and our liberal politics of hope. And we've got to lead that and we've got to win for our country and for our world... And so you better be choosing the next Liberal Democrat Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Joe's absolutely right on media. We need to be out in the media far more than we have been. But I have a sense that we've been in a vicious circle when we're low in the opinion polls and people aren't going to be interested in, in us. And now we're going up. And through our results, through our successes, through the, all the work that you've done, pounding the payments, delivering those leafers, I know you love that, you know. I really know you love that. Um, from all that, I think we're now in a virtuous circle. And what I think we need to do is to be robust with the media. Why don't they put us on now? Why do they put bloody Farage on? And I think we should be strong with the BBC Trust, with all the senior journalists to say, we're now top of the polls, we should get more coverage than anyone else. And when we're on the TV, and when we're on the radio, let our messages be clear and simple. Stop Brexit. Yeah. Tackle climate change. And make a fairer society. I thank you very much, both Ed and Joe. Um, and good luck with your, I think about 15 other hustings. I suspect they're going to know each other's responses quite well by the end of that. Um, I also want to thank the Islington local party for the arrangements for the venue and for having the bar. I'm told the bar is open for a little bit longer and if you are an Islington Lib Dem member or supporter and don't know your local party, go to the bar because... Uh, some of the people will be there to greet you. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm, uh, Terry's whispering, there might even be some leaflets to deliver as well. We have a lot of people to say thank you to. And just to let you know that today alone, 1,500 people have joined the party. We are running at over 10,000 in the last few days. This is a real surge and it keeps on coming. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your support this evening. If you want to ask further questions of your candidates, they've both got websites up and running. Go to it. Thank you. Good night.